Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Gerner. I'm the Cultural Program Coordinator at Deutsches Haus, and I just wanted to say a very brief welcome to everyone. Um, we're so delighted to have you here for tonight's panel discussion entitled Welcome to the Occupation, Squatting, and Resistance from Berlin to New York, which we are happy to present in collaboration with the Urban Democracy Lab. And so I'm actually really just going to say a few brief words of thanks and then head hand it over to Becky Amato from the Urban Democracy Lab. Um, we wanted to thank the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange, Exchange Service, um, for their continued support of our <laughs> academic programming. And so without them, a lot of our programming wouldn't be possible. Um, secondly, I wanted to say um, a big, big thank you to Becky Amato and the Urban Democracy Lab um, for putting together this event, basically. I mean, I say it's a collaboration, but Becky does such amazing, amazing work with this. And, um, you know, this wonderful panel wouldn't have come together without her. So um, I'm about to hand things over to her. I also wanted to thank our student workers and our interns who without whom you wouldn't have chairs to sit on, basically. They really set up the room and organize everything here. And last but not least, our audience for coming and for your interest in our programming. Um, and I would like to hand things over to Becky now, who's going to explain um, the setup um, and introduce our wonderful panelists. And please um, give a warm welcome to Becky. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. And thank you to Sarah and to Juliana, um, who could make it tonight, um, and Deutsches Haus and everybody here for hosting us, because this is a beautiful space. We don't always get beautiful spaces at the Urban Democracy Lab, so I'm very appreciative. Um, so I'm Becky Amato. I'm the Associate Director at the Urban Democracy Lab. Um, the lab is a few years old here at NYU, and we um, sponsor a lot of different kind of programming and fellowships around bringing scholars and practitioners and activists together in conversation. And so this is, you know, an extension of that theme. Um, so we're particularly excited to have this um, panel with us tonight. And I just wanted to say a couple of words about why we decided to have this panel. So, of course, we always have these international themes um, in collaboration with Deutsches Haus. There is always a German angle to what we do. Um, every year we, we do a project with them. Um, and this year, you know, as we have these larger conversations internationally around the precarity of housing and the affordability or lack of affordability of housing, um, this seemed like a particularly important conversation to have um, historically in a contemporaneous way. Um, and so I'm particularly excited to have everybody here to talk to it, to talk to the topic. We're missing somebody this evening, unfortunately. Sophie Gonick wasn't able to join us, um, but we still have a great team. Uh, we are also joined, as you can see by the screen here, technology is serving us this evening, um, by a scholar from abroad. Um, so I'll introduce him first. This is Alexander Vasudevan. Uh, who is Associate Professor in Human Geography and a Fellow at Christ Church College, the University of Oxford. He is the author of Metropolitan Preoccupations, The Spatial Politics of Squatting in Berlin, and the forthcoming, The Autonomous, actually, yeah, it's forthcoming. You just have a preview a copy. It's out in May, actually, I think, in the U.S. Okay, so very, very soon, you shall all be able to purchase The Autonomous City, A History of Urban Squatting. He is also the co-author of Geographies of Forced Eviction, Dispossession, Violence, Insecurity, with Catherine Brickell and Melissa Fernandez Arigoitia. Vasudevan's research has been published in a number of major journals, including Antipode, Cultural Geographies, Environment and Planning, uh, Progress in Human Geography, and Social and Cultural Geography. He has written for The Guardian, Open Democracy, and New Left Project. Uh, Vasudevan is currently working on a project that explores the history and politics of urban precarity. Oh. Perfect. Um, down at the end of the table is Amy Starachewski. Um, she's also a cultural anthropologist and an oral historian whose research focuses on the use of oral history and social movements and the politics of urban property. She is the co-director of the Oral History MA program at Columbia University. In 2005, she won the Oral History Association's article award for uh, squatting history, the power of oral history as a history-making pr practice. And in 2016, the Sapiens Allegra Will the Next Margaret Mead Please Stand Up Prize for Public Anthropological Writing. 
Uh, Staracheski received a PhD in cultural anthropology from the CUNY Graduate Center, where she was a public humanities fellow. Her book, Hours to Lose, When Squatters Became Homeowners in New York City, was published in 2016 by the University of Chicago Press and was an inspiration for this panel. Um, next, we have Frank Morales, uh, who is a writer, activist, and Episcopal priest, and currently pastor at All Souls Church in Harlem. A conscientious objector during the Vietnam War, uh, Frank began squatting in the South Bronx in 1980. In 1985, he moved to the Lower East Side where he was born and raised and immediately engaged with hundreds of others in a burgeoning squatters movement, which at its peak occupied some 30 abandoned buildings throughout the neighborhood. In 2004, he received a Project Censored Award, one of two, for his article entitled Homeland Offense, Pentagon Declares War on America, about the growing consolidation of the police and military. As housing organizer with Picture of the Homeless in 2009, he advocated then and continues to advocate and organize for the occupation of vacant, unused housing in order to create homes and to resist the racist counterinsurgency against the poor known as homelessness. And then finally, we have our moderator, who we were very lucky to have in town this week. Um, Pierpaolo Mudu is a geographer collaborating with the Urban Studies and Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences faculties at the University of Washington, Tacoma. He has previously worked in different universities in the UK, Oxford and Reading, and Italy, Rome, and has been visiting in France, EHESS in Paris, and Université de Marseille, also in South Korea, Sungshin Women's, you've been everywhere, uh, University in Seoul, and at the University of Washington. The main focus of his research is on the development of contemporary Rome as related to social movements and migrations and the transformation of public space. He has written several books and published in several journals, including Acme, Antipode, Geojournal, and Urban Geography. So this is an illustrious panel. I'm very excited to hear from you. Thank you. So we're going to start actually with Alex, um, just to give you an idea of what we're doing. We're going to have him speak. And we're going to take him down, but then he'll be back for Q&A. He's going to be here the whole time. You just won't see him. Thanks. Are you with me to get started then? Yeah. OK. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, you for allowing me to speak via Skype. And of course, for the very generous invitation on behalf of the organizers, it's a real honor to be part of such a fantastic panel and to address the topic of what is immense urgency in the current conjuncture and the discussion about affordability and precarity around housing is certainly um, an international question in a number of different ways. Now, I think what I want to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is say a few things about my work on squatting, about radical housing politics, and about urban precarity. And I'm going to narrow my sidelines, if that's OK, focus on the book that came out in late 2015 on the history of squatting in Berlin. And I think the narrative arc for that particular book will also move for some of the questions and conversations that I hope we can have this evening. Um, as uh, Becky said in the introduction, I also have a forthcoming book on the history of squatting in Europe and North America. It's a sort of more popular account of some of these kinds of practices. And I, I may come back to that in my concluding comments, and perhaps we can turn to the discussion. Well, I thought, given the nature of this evening's session and the kinds of questions we're talking about, I'd focus on Berlin with my own comments. Uh, now, if you could also indulge me for a moment, I think this is something I mentioned in the book as well. This is very much a book that would not have been possible uh, without the tremendous generosity of the many archivists with whom I work across Berlin and Germany. So these are collections that mean a great deal to me, and their survival and use are vital for how we might still come to think about and inhabit cities differently. And you could argue that in their longevity and in difference, we might detect something of the radical infrastructure that figures so prominently I've opened the page of the book. And I don't think it would be a stretch to think of squatters as urban archivists, um, and perhaps as radical custodians of the city. And I think this is something that comes through really strongly um, in Amy's recently published book as well. And I think maybe that could figure out the wider conversation this evening. Now, in terms of the book, it's also a project that has a long gestation. Um, so past to nine years. I spent countless months in Berlin. And this is a project that really grew out of the various conversations, the discussions, and interviews that I conducted with activists in the city. And it's very much, I guess, written with the spirit of those conversations in mind. Um, more generally, I would also add the book would not have been possible without, without the actions undertaken by squatters themselves. And I'm reminded of a wonderful graffiti quote, Amicia, 
uh, from that spoke Zarathustra, which was figured on the wall of a squad. It's actually not in Berlin, it was in Freiburg, but it was around the same time. And it was, and I quote, must still have chaos oneself to give birth to a dancing star. Man muss noch Chaos in sich haben, um ein Tissenden Stern gewähren zu können. And I can't help but think that cities would become more just and livable places if we were more willing to accept this sense of creative disorder. Now, I think for the rest of my, my comment, if you like, I'll, I'll keep brief. Um, I'll say a few things about the book, but I'll try to situate the book within a wider project that resonates with conversations or debates about urban precarity. Right? So in practical terms, in very, the book is very much, I guess, the first book lens to study in English of the cultural and political geographies of squatting in Berlin, and as such, the project that seeks to develop a thick description, I guess, a rich historical account of the various struggles in the city over the making of an alternative urban imagination, as well as a search for new radical solutions to a lack of housing infrastructure. So I guess what the book focuses on is really on what squatters actually did, uh, by which I mean the terms and tactics they employed, the ideas and spaces they created. So this is a history um, in turn that has had a significant impact on the transformation of Berlin's landscape and has shaped recent struggles over the city's identity, especially when set against the baleful landscape of gentrification, which is a place that, of course, many of us are familiar with, not only in Berlin, but in other cities, including New York, of course. And as I argue, squatters in the space that they occupied were never incidental. They were never minor details in the formation and evolution of the new left in West Germany in the 1960s, various social movements which developed in the decades that followed. They played, if anything, a vital role in opening up new perspectives on the various form and the substance of the life that radical political action and solidarity could assume, and are supported in turn by figures that point, if you like, an alternative video, which was made up of thousands of activists and an even larger circle of sympathizers. So in Berlin, if you look at this history, it stretches back into the since the early 70s. There have been at least 600 or so separate squats of a broadly political nature um, from 1970 to 2014. And the majority of these actions took place in the city's old tenement blocks, the Minsk zone, that they were known in, in local parlance. So they also encompassed, encompassed a range of websites, abandoned villas, factories, schools, to parks, vacant plots, and even in one case, a so part of that death strip that formed the border between West and East Berlin. And the squatting was a form of local occupation, and it typically fell under Section 123 of the German Penal Code, uh, or trespassing. Though many magistrates in Berlin, as well as elsewhere in West Germany, were reluctant to charge squatters that, in their eyes, a rundown apartment did not satisfy the legal test for an apartment or a pacified state. And more specifically, and as I tried to unpack in the book, there were really two major waves of squatting in the city. The first wave between 1979 and 1984, so there were squats earlier in the early 70s, but the first major wave was late 70s, early 80s, involved over 260 separate sites, activists, and other local residents responded to a deepening housing crisis by occupying apartments, the overwhelming majority of which were located in districts of points of Schickenberg. At the height of this wave in spring of 1981, it's estimated that there were at least 2,000 active schools in West Berlin, as well as tens of thousands of borders as well. Now, the second wave took place between 1989 and 1998. It kind of shifted the gravity of the scene, if you like, to the former East. Hundreds of activists exploited the political power vacuum that accompanied the fall of the Berlin Wall. Squatting from 80 states, both the former East as well as the West. In many ways, the scene came to the abrupt violent end of power, the eviction of squatters uh, from Mainz or Spassa in November 1990. Now, since 1991, there have been only around 100 or so occupations across Berlin as local authorities have vigorously police prescribed neutralized attempts to squat. Of these squats, 56 were evicted by the police within four days. Overall, 200 spaces have been legalized, and in 35 cases, the squatters have themselves acquired the farm ownership. And while these figures point to the sheer scale and intensity of squatting, I should add that they don't take into account other forms of more deprivation-based squatting carried out by homeless people, nor do they include the large number of East Berliners from the late 60s to the end of the German Democratic Republic 
is equally occupied as the process known as Schwab's form. And I can come back to that point a bit later on. But in saying all of it, I think it was a surprise that in, in doing work on, with the backdrop of the German you left in mind, there was really little empirical work uh, on the role of squatting and the build form and geography more generally, the creation uh, and circulation of new activist imagination, not to mention the production of collective modes of living, perhaps outside those usual forms of activist hate geography, if you like. And I was, what I was interested, why did the of activists and citizens choose to break the pop? Why did they occupy empty flats and other buildings across Germany and Berlin in particular? Were these actions dictated by pure necessity, or did they represent a new kind of desire to imagine other ways of living collectively or living together? Who, in other words, were these squatters, and what were the central characteristics of urban squatting? In other words, what were the goals, what were the action repertoires, what were the political influences they mobilized and adopted? And I think, perhaps quite simply, what I tried to do in the book is develop three interrelated perspectives on the everyday practices of squatters in the city and their relationship to recent debates about you know, the right to the city and the potential for perhaps assembling or building an alternate urban imagination. Now, the first one was really an attempt to, I guess, push back against the challenge existing historical scholarship on the new left in Germany by arguing that the time has come to think geographically to spatialize the events practices, participants that shaped the history of the anti-authoritarian revolts in the 60s and the 70s and in the early 80s. And so doing perhaps recreate or trace it like complex geographies of connection, of networking, of solidarity that were at its heart. And so I guess the main point here is that this first perspective is predominantly uh, a historical one, insofar as it represents or is predicated on trying to rethink or center the way in which the West German New Left and its various underlocks have been narrated or understood. And this is very much an attempt to respond to the kind of historical confiscation that has increasingly shaped recent accounts of this period by self-appointed leaders of the movement, who in many cases have indulged in a form of retrospective revisionism, elevating their own significance, while perhaps dulling the movement's more radical legend. Um, so in that sense, this is very much been the sort of historical focus of this project, and I've tried to take a few risks as well in developing both the book in my wider interest in urban squatting. So, context of the book project, I've tried to widen my sidelines beyond conventional ways of thinking about period, and to take in developments both before and after the fall of the Broken Wall, while at the same time locating the imagination or imaginaries of squatters within a much wider narrative of uh, displacement and disposition that uh, stretches back to the 19th century and a much longer history of creative destruction in Berlin. But I also chose to try to take the development in East Berlin and explore an alternative history of occupation that stretched from the late 1960s to the fall of the wall, which has remained largely undocumented. And while the actions of squatters in the East differed understandably from those mobilized in the West, what was referred to as Schwarzwald played an important role in the development uh, of a dissident public sphere in the German Democratic Republic in the 70s and 80s, not to mention the new wave of squatting that erupted in Berlin and elsewhere in the winter of 1989. So that's the first kind of overarching perspective that shaped the book in my the wider interest in the history of squatting in Berlin. Now the second perspective was particular attention to squat spaces as, as alternative sites of inhabitation that in turn speak radical differences of sickness that is, the city's capacity to reorganize and structure the ways in which people, places, materials, and ideas come together. And so my animating impulse here was really to develop a more empirically grounded account of the history of the water movement, which at the same time also was interested or committed to developing an original geographic framework for investigating and rethinking the possibilities of radical urban change. And so what I guess I was really doing is trying to find a theoretical footprint that was key to developing an approach that challenged how we come to think about and inhabit the city. Um, and also a theoretical footprint or a theory that was amenable to the practices, the everyday practices of squats themselves. Um, there's much more that could be said here, but suffice to say for the moment that any adequate theory of urban squatting in its various geographies needs to get to grips with the fundamental ambiguity that often characterizes life in these places. 
So in other words, the conceptual armature required must to a large extent accommodate the habit of representality of water itself. So that second overarching perspective is largely conceptual, one geared towards how we could perhaps align an understanding of housing scarcity and urban precarity with different ways of conceptualizing urban politics. And related to that, it kind of brings me to the book's third main perspective, is to be just off a thick description of the history of the squatting seat in Berlin, to document those everyday experiences, those practices, those sentiments uh, of squatters and the role that they came to play in making a radical political horizons. And so what I tried to do was really just collect the various voices, the ideas, the practices, the knowledge produced by the squatter, um, while retracing the, the transversal path to revolt they themselves often follow. So what I try to do is really invite readers to step in with and alongside squatters whose actions were documented in magazines, in posters, film, that is sort of written and recorded in the white heat of the moment. And so I guess what I was looking at is really how squatters were able to cultivate an ethos of self-determination and autonomy, uh, what I described briefly as a radical DIY empiricism, that focused on the rehabilitation of buildings and the active assembling of new forms of dwelling. One of the, the kind of phrases I used throughout the book and, and some of my other works is this kind of notion of a makeshift urbanism. So in other words, how makeshift materials and do-it-yourself practices combined with the sharing of food and other resources to provide the infrastructural and material supports for collective self management And so I guess the idea I'm getting at here is the ways in which squat spaces represent fragile combination of materials of ideas, knowledges, and practices through which other identity and intimacy, intimacies were conformed, but also new commonalities and solidarities developed and shared. So this notion of a kind of alternative infrastructure that you know urged in Berlin period was something that squatters actively produced. Now, just as I kind of kind of wrap things up, it'd be misleading to advance a just passionate view of the history of squatting in Berlin, which was untainted by disagreement or dissent. Um, the action repertoire, which is adopted by the squatters in the city, often varied from house to house. And there were significant differences, there were significant discontinuities across a long and uneven history of protest and resistance. In other words, the ability to act as a movement was not only dependent on the mobilization of specific skills, it also involved emotional labor. It also involved a range of emotional practices that played an important role in sustaining new spaces, infrastructures, and networks. The Berlin squats were the kind of space saturated with intense feelings, joy and hope, equally anger and despair, as squatters are moved by their actions and accomplishments, but correspondingly shaken by the losses and failures they also experienced. Now, I think I'm going to leave things there just to say that the three perspectives are very briefly sketched out a historical one, a theoretical one, and here's one speak uh, not only to their own contributions, but to some of my ongoing research on urban precarity. And much of this product, my work has been really under the shadow of a part of the historical moment. And so, to broaden things out, uh, and also draw my, my more recent book into the conversation, I think it's fair to say that the recent resuscitation of squatting. And other occupation-based practices is undeniably tethered to housing scarcity and the predations of, of, of a capitalist economic system. But we shouldn't lose sight that people squat for many reasons, and the ability to reorganize and reimagine the built form in our cities is one important reason. And I try to see these dynamics in dialectical tension. I should also add in the context of Europe, hard not to sort of stress the importance of squatted spaces and the role they played more recently in offering an alternative infrastructure, a geography of care and empathy in the context of the ongoing refugee crisis. Now, all this set against the backdrop of intensifying criminalization, of intensifying repression, has made it more difficult to squat. Though there are, I would also argue, as a way of concluding, that there are new fault lines and connectivities. I'm really keen to think about the links that we can develop as urbanists, as geographers, as anthropologists, as historians, uh, and as activists as well, that promise to forged connections across the north-south divide that promised other alternatives and possibilities. I think there is still a future if we think about the question of urban squ uh, squatting. Very housing scarcity is very promised to take control of their housing needs. And I think that history is a little bit an active one. So I think I'll leave my comments there and I look forward to the conversation. And I also appreciate your patience um, in terms of <coughs> speaking by uh, Skype. So thank you very much uh, for all of that. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. So 
so i'm an oral historian as well as an anthropologist as well as a former squatter and and so i'm going to be playing some oral histories for you this evening um but to start off with just a little bit of context um <clears throat> it's funny i can see alex on here but you guys can't see him <laughs> um <clears throat> This is a map of some of the squats and squatter related spaces on the Lower East Side drawn by Fly, who's a squatter and artist, uh, historian, and a collaborator of, mine, collaborator of mine on this project. Uh, the Lower East Side was home to a squatting movement uh, from the mid-1980s uh, through the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, really unlike any other in the United States. And that was because of the unique mix of influences that squatters were bringing together here in New York City, just a few miles from where we're sitting right now. Um, they were combining urban homesteading with local Latino-led uh, anti-displacement activism with inspiration from the yippies and the hippies, from DIY punk, and uh, you know, probably of most interest for us this evening um, with European squatters. So there was a lot of back and forth between European squatters and squatters in New York City, um, and that really changed the dynamic of what people could imagine was possible here um, and how they went about pursuing it. So while we often hear um, in Europe of people sort of taking over buildings <clears throat> and living in them in a, in a pretty normal way right away, um, here in New York City, the buildings that squatters took um, were really barely buildings at all. Uh, you know, they very rarely had both a roof and stairs. They didn't have water, plumbing, electricity, um, drains, really anything that you would need to make a home in a building. Um, and so I wanted to start off by playing you a clip from Rolando Politi, who's actually a European squatter that came here um, because he had heard through the grapevine of European social centers um, that the Lower East Side was ripe for a squatting movement. Um, and so he's talking about what the buildings were like um, in the early 1980s when he got there. And the photo you see here is the entryway to Bullet Space, which is the building where he lives. Um, and you can see some of his recycled bottle art framing the doorway. Can you tell me what the buildings were like, actually, when you first moved into them? Describe the, the physical condition or what they, what they felt like, what they smelled like, sounded yeah. like. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty horrible. You know, this talk about the smells, uh, some kind of bad animals, bad, that kind of nauseating smell, smell of a lot of... Um, Mufa, how is in English that word? Um, mold, <laughs> mold and mildew, a lot of that, a lot of that. Plus excrements, dried up ones, some not so dried up ones, which is not bad when they're liquid. Uh, like in the basement, in one building, uh, there was a lot of shit taken out from the sewage area, but broken pipe. I remember going there with boots, big boots, but that not so bad, the smell, as long as there was water, humidity, they had this kind of musty, you know, subterranean smell, kind of like Third Man from the movie in Vietnam, and he goes and runs through the switch. Uh, on the higher, upper floors, much, much nicer, of course, just uh, more closer to the air. Uh, 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 pigeons coming in, you know, freely. Talk about freedom again. <laughs> also, the pigeons had great freedom in those days. They were going in and out, open windows, open roofs. Uh, yeah, apocalyptic, but, but also very interesting and free at the same time. You know, uh, liberating, I mean, liberating, that's a good good word. Like and inviting you to like, okay, let's get started, you know, and, and yet, where do we start? Which, but a nice feeling to it, because, uh, uh, well, because there's nobody stopping you from doing whatever you want to, you know, to do within, you know, the, the collaborative situation. So Alex talked about the idea of squatters as people who produce new activist imaginaries of what cities might be, and we hear Rolando here um, talking about uh, a, a you know, shit-filled, abandoned building as a space of liberating potential and freedom. Um, of course, 
uh, there's, a, there's a problem with that, right? That this wasn't a neighborhood that was empty. There wasn't nobody telling you what you could and couldn't do there. There were lots of people living on the Lower East Side. Um, and it's easy, I think, to think about neighborhoods that have experienced abandonment and disinvestment and arson um, in the way that that neighborhood has um, as frontiers, um, as places that are ready for resettlement. Um, and of course, you know, even if that was the imaginary at the time, when people came from outside of the neighborhood to squat on the Lower East Side, they found it was a, a neighborhood full of people, full of life, full of ideas, full of art and activity. Um, and the um, interactions that ensued you know, ranged from collaboration and friendship um, to sometimes what looked a little bit more like guerrilla warfare. This is a picture of, um, just sort of show a bit of the kinds of work that squatters are doing on the Lower East Side. This is another picture courtesy of Fly. Um, and you can see people, you know, rebuilding brick walls. And this is rebuilding the um, wall on the parapet at 297th Street. And I want to just briefly say a little bit about sort of the, the politics of legitimacy um, of squatting on the Lower East Side because it's, very different from the politics of legitimacy in many European cities, particularly European cities where there was a stronger social democracy. Squatting in New York took hold um, in the aftermath of New York City's fiscal crisis when all of the social democratic resources and freedoms that New Yorkers had come to expect were really under attack, diminished. Um, the resources to provide social housing um, had mostly been cut and taken away. Um, and so squatters were not um, able to automatically claim a right to take city-owned housing. They had to really fight to uh, make an argument about why they were legitimate. Um, and you can see this is a New York Times article. Um, and uh, Antonio Pagan, who is one of the squatters' most vocal critics, um, says here, no one should have a God-given right to public property. Yeah, no one should have a God-given right to public property. The infamous minority creating havoc around Tompkins Square Park are living out their revolutionary fantasies. They are white, middle-class young people from the suburbs hiding behind the banner of helping the homeless. Um, and when we look at squatting in European cities, we see a same kind of dynamic of um, trying to set up a conflict between good squatters and bad squatters, deserving squatters and undeserving squatters, often along lines of race and class. Um, so this is you know, not an accurate portrayal of who squatters in the Lower East Side actually were. Um, they were a diverse group of people um, from a lot of different backgrounds, many from outside of the neighborhood, but some from the neighborhood, um, squatting for a lot of different reasons. Um, but because they were in a situation where abandonment was quickly giving way to gentrification, um, they were vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. They managed to hold on to many buildings for decades. Um, this is a photograph of the eviction watch list, um, which is basically a phone tree um, that allowed squatters to contact a network of supporters um, to use a decentralized structure very effectively um, to call for support in the event of um, an eviction or an attempted eviction or a fire or whatever kind of crisis was happening. Um, and on the right, we see something really important in the context of this conversation, um, which is squatters resisting eviction. Um, squatters on the Lower East Side were not shy about using direct action to keep their homes. And it, I think in part influenced by what they were seeing and learning from European squatters, they fought as if they actually might win. Um, so in Europe, people would um, resist an eviction and actually fight back the police um, because of a different tradition of street fighting, because of police who were using different kinds of technologies, and because of a different sense that people had a right to claim housing that was owned by the government and keep it. Um, and squatters in New York City um, really learned that lesson and learned it well and were able to use a much broader repertoire of tactics to resist eviction um, more successfully than in other cities. And it's not that they necessarily were always able to keep buildings when, by fighting with the police, but that it was so difficult and so expensive and so dramatic to actually do these evictions that they were able to hold on for longer. Um, so this is one of the probably most famous and dramatic evictions in 1995 um, on East 13th Street. 
Um, and so I think in part because of this um, history of direct action, um, squatters were able to hold on to their buildings long enough that the city became willing to make a deal with them. Um, so in the late 1990s, New York City no longer wanted to be the landlord of last resort. They were trying to sell off as much public property as possible, including um, community gardens um, and also city-owned apartment buildings. And it was really um, hard, if not impossible, to sell a building that was full of squatters that even the city couldn't evict. Um, and so um, in the aftermath of evictions like those on 13th Street, um, in 1999, squatters um, opened a di dialogue with the city um, using the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, which is a nonprofit that came out of the homesteading movement in the 1980s. Um, as an intermediary, and they made a deal to sell 11 of the 12 remaining squats in the Lower East Side to UHAB for $1 each. UHAB would then take out loans on the squatters' behalf to renovate the buildings, bring them up to code. Once they were legally inhabitable, the squatters could be acknowledged. The buildings were sold technically vacant, um, and they would become limited equity low-income co-ops. Um, and so uh, it seems funny now, but at the time, people imagined that this whole process might take a year or two. Um, in 2009, seven years after the deal was announced, the first building completed the process, and that's actually Rolando's building, Bullet Space. Um, as of 2017, there are still two, maybe three, that are in the final stages, am I right? Um, last time I checked, it was three, and I think maybe now it's two. Um, so this was a long, messy, complicated process, um, and I'll close by just um, sharing two um, testimonies from people living in the buildings about what this uh, means to them, how they make sense of it. So this is Jeff Dan. And the city, I think, was forced, you know, to make this, um, create this program, especially for us. And what, they were probably just like, what are we going to do with these people? They won't leave. They're not going to buy the buildings. You know, they're not going to just someday show up and say, here's a million dollars. We'd like to purchase our building. So they, they created this thing where they could, I mean, in a way it seems cool, but in a, at the same time, I think the way they set it up for us is they're kind of like trying to set us up for failure or at least weed out the bad seeds, you know, and get rid of the bad apples and only keep the real responsible ones who can work and make money and give them money, pay taxes. I think that's what they did. It might be a big trick, who knows? Because the way I see it, we're, we were all just a bunch of squatters and we didn't want those responsibilities to begin with. So how are they gonna turn squatters into responsible citizens? Can they? That's like a social studies um, experiment. That could be studied from for the next thousands of years in colleges all over the world. How they turned a bunch of squatters into responsible citizens, tax-paying citizens. Yes, a few of them ended up in jail, but for the most part, we were able to break them too. So, you know, one thing we can talk more about later is the connection or lack of connection between Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere squatting movements. Um, and Frank is actually one person that's helped me think about one possible way of connecting the two, and, and they're not as connected as maybe they should be, um, which is, you know, thinking of these kinds of deals as really a World Bank-style debt trap, right? Um, that this is not a clear victory. Um, and the question of what the end game is with squatting as a tactic is not a clear or an easy one. Um, so one of the things that made the squatting movement on the Lower East Side um, particularly unique is that its aims included but went beyond, and for some people didn't include at all, ownership or legal occupation. So there are many squatting movements that um, have as their goal to get title to the property that they're squatting or to get a license or to get a, a, a lease, right? To get some kind of legal right to be there um, or to gain um, you know, some kind of policy victory in the realm of public or, or subsidized housing. Um, on the Lower East Side, there were people squatting who did not have that as an aim, um, who were squatting as a critique of private property, um, who were squatting um, from a far left political perspective or an anarchist perspective, um, and when they were offered the opportunity to become homeowners, did not want it. 
um, but they saw no other way to be able to stay in these buildings. Um, and so that's part of what led to the process. I think taking so long, um, and then <coughs> the last person I'll play is Maggie Bigley. And she also lives in Rolando's building. She's Australian, you'll hear. We were accused of everything, you know, speculation, trying to steal these buildings, of profiteering, of, of you know, wanting, you know, just to steal stuff and get over and, you know, we were all from out of town and nobody, nobody, uh, you know, nobody was local, nobody had any commitment to the neighborhood, nobody. And that's the beautiful thing about where we are today is because we can say that we are the only people that came out of this entire history that actually meant what we said. And we said it was about affordable housing. It will all, these buildings will always be affordable housing. And, um, you know, and that's everybody that, that, you know, fought so hard against us, you know, all these nonprofit groups, they're, they're, they're flipped. Their buildings flipped. They're all market rate now, you know. So it's like all those, you know, we, we, we really, I'm, I'm really proud, you know, we proved that, we, you know, what we were doing was, what we said and what we did was, was the one and the same. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, took a long time to, to be able to say that we proved it, yeah. but you know, it's, it's a fantastic thing. It's like a gift to the neighborhood. So I shared uh, an, you know, Antonio Pagan's critique of the squatters in the New York Times with you, in part to give context for what Maggie's saying here, right? She's responding to exactly those kinds of critiques, that squatters aren't serious about making affordable housing, that they're asking for something for nothing, that they're thieves, that they're lazy. Um, that they um, aren't really committed to the neighborhood. Um, and so in closing, one of the questions that was raised for us was, um, is there a sense of history within the current movement and understanding of what has worked and not worked in the past? Um, and I, would, I was interested to hear Alex talk about um, squatters as a particular kind of urban archivist, um, because squatters on the Lower East Side have been extraordinarily active in documenting um, and talking about their own history. Um, they have they do storytelling slideshows with archival images. Um, this is a picture of Fly videotaping someone speaking at a, f a funeral for a squatter. This is Fly sorting and managing her archives. Um, this is the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space being built in the storefront of Sea Squat. Oh, sorry, there's one more I wanted to show you. Ah. This is a uh, museum exhibit in the storefront of Bullet Space called The Perfect Crime, um, an art show that happened um, right after they legalized where things like roofing tools and now obsolete wood burning stoves were displayed really explicitly as artifacts um, as a way of documenting this history. Um, and I think that Frank can talk a lot more um, about um, how this history has been used and can be used in the present moment. So thank you all for your attention and I'll turn it over. Uh, okay, well, I don't want to take up too much time because we want to have a lot of time for discussion. So I answered a few, my son is a college student, he's actually here at, at NYU. And whenever he gets a paper, I always say to him, uh, what's the prompt? In other words, what's the question? <laughs> Make sure you answer the question in the paper. So I dutifully uh, took some of the prompts that Be um, Becky sent, and I'll, I'll look at that in a minute. But uh, I just wanted to say some general comments about you know who I am. And um, yeah, I, I uh, began squatting in, in the late 70s in the South Bronx. At that point, the South Bronx was synonymous with urban poverty and maybe some of you remember, um, was visually kind of bombed out. And, and the whole question of how um, neighborhoods across the country became that way, I think is, um, is a central question that we're not gonna address tonight, kind of the origins of homelessness and all of that. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the, I was working in a church and my contract had finished up and I wanted to stay in the neighborhood. So along with uh, just hundreds of abandoned buildings everywhere, vacant buildings. And again, this is not, these are not walk in and make yourself at home kind of places. These are places that are really wrecked. You know, you walk in, uh, the roof beams are, you know, at the front door. You're looking up five stories and maybe there's a central stairs, probably not. 
Um, it really, really, you know, pretty bad. In any case, um, myself and a number of folks in the, in the community started um, doing kind of what we felt was common sense, really, because it was um, the emergence of homelessness as a category, a separate category. You know, we used to refer to people as former tenants as opposed to that phrase, because that phrase then became a sub, sort of subspecies of another kind of person. Um, this is in the 80s, you know, the Reagan and homelessness and so on. So I learned from a lot of the young lords, uh, people there, it was 100% Puerto Rican, primarily Puerto Rican people. Um, my dad's Puerto Rican. Um, so we began moving into these buildings and cleaning them out, schlepping out the debris and doing what, you know, birds make nests, people make houses, you know, it's, it's what you do. And uh, so we began doing that, and there was some, some ideology around it, but it was really kind of folks coming from the outside. Uh, we had a number of folks who came from uh, El Salvador at the time, and from some from Mexico, um, from Tierra Libertad, who were squatter organizations in Latin America. And uh, we learned from them. We were printing bandanas for the FMLN um, down in our basement during this period, and it was very exciting. Um, in any case, I grew up in the, in the Lower East Side in the, on, uh, in the Jacob Reese projects on Avenue D. Um, in fact, we were one of the first families in the projects. Um, and uh, I wanted to come back home in 80, by 85. So I moved back down to the neighborhood. And, but there was really no place that, you know, the neighborhood was already beginning to become gentrified. So we engaged in a squatter movements, uh, movement there. People just, you know, you'd hear every day, people on the street. It was spontaneous. Um, hey, did you hear? People took a building on 6th Street. And, oh, yeah, there's another one. It's, you know, it was like that. You just were moving around. And then little by little, we began to consolidate some um, around mutual defense. In other words, the, the, the only, you know, the buildings were, were autonomous and and it was kind of the unspoken was that people who worked in those buildings, um, they controlled things. That nothing from the outside was going to tell you how to run your building. Um, but little by little, um, as we started to have our eviction watch meetings, because that eviction watch list um, grew out of collective meetings. So by, at the time, we said 10 or dozen buildings or so were going from 14th Street to Houston. Um, we would have monthly, pretty much monthly meetings um, where everybody would come together, share tools, who's a good electrician, you know, like who knows what, you know, just kind of sharing stuff, people moving from one building to another, just collective. But really what it was about was, was mutual defense. Um, that kind of brought us together so that we could respond um, rapidly. The idea with the eviction watch was to have a kind of rapid deployment force because um, folks, I've been, you know, last number of years attended a number of squeak meetings at European Squatter Network, um, and, uh, you know, Pierre can tell you more about that, but, and folks there would ask, well, how did you guys manage to actually stay in the buildings? You know, you're, you got a build, you know, you, you're very high premium on private property in New York City, and, you know, sort of super gentrification in the, in the neighborhood, 40,000 police, and so on, how did you manage? And really, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because it was a synergy of effects, really. Um, getting the folks out, um, very thin veneer of legal uh, support around the so-called 30-day law. You know, if you can prove that you've been in a building for, for more than 30 days with, through receipt of mail, um, then uh, you're, tr you know, you're moved from trespasser to uh, from trespass to a to a tenant, you know, to someone who needs to be evicted through some sort of due process. So we would have our mail. We would show if the cops showed up independently on their own, they're just walking the beat and they'd say, What are you guys doing here? We'd we'd have an apartment on the ground floor with a little cot and a picture on the wall and say, No, we live here, he's here's you know, and if you could just show that you were living there and not you know, you didn't have burglar tools and all that stuff, they would leave you alone. It was only when they were, when NYPD was receiving orders directly from the mayor um, that they responded the way they did. 
And, you know, we had a number of confrontations with the police and never really um, engaged in any violence, per se. We didn't, we didn't fling cinder blocks off the wall. The, the worst we ever did was to throw a, someone dumped a piss bucket, um, a fairly fermented pea from the, <laughs> which definitely scattered the troops, that, you know, and, and that, but that was, that was as far as it went with that. But um, through messaging and, and uh, you know, lots of support in the community. Um, you know, the neighborhood at that point was very diverse. You guys know these village, you know, and it was very diverse. Our buildings were very diverse. 50% um, people of color, um, young and old, some very old people and some, you know, young runaways. It was a real mix, mix, <coughs> all kinds of people, some who were, you know, died in the wool, uh, you know, anarchists and so on and so forth, and others who were there because uh, they didn't want to sleep on a bench, you know. And, and uh, it made for an interesting, you know, psychological challenge when you'd all meet together because all the decisions are made. Even you'd have a meeting and, and somebody would say, well, I don't agree with that. I'm going to talk to, uh, you know, well, who are you going to talk to? There's nobody outside. And when it begins to dawn on you that, that, you know, you're it, once you pass the threshold of being in there for a month or two or three, and you start to get the sense that we're good, we're here, nobody's coming for us, you know, and you get beyond that, then it really gets really interesting. You know, it's, uh, you work on the building together, you, there's a certain kind of a joy and freedom that's very hard to express. Um, because you realize that, um, you know, y you don't have to work that job in order to pay that rent. You don't have to, you know, you can, you can concentrate on your, on your, you know, what kind of art you're doing or what, what sort of academic uh, career you'd like to pursue or any number of things that you, that you otherwise couldn't do if you were, you know, in that kind of wage slavery situation or whatever it might be. And it, it, you don't really understand that until you actually experience what it's like, you know, that kind of sense of freedom. Um, yeah, you know, we had occasionally, you, you, we had to jump the light from the street, first from the street lights and, and so on. You know, it was a very difficult situation. You know, kerosene heat uh, to start off, uh, K1, pure kerosene, um, you know, like that. Um, the ovens, we'd, we'd create various things, but to the, the creative, um, you know, the, it's, just, it's just unleashed in this kind of situation where people just make ways in which to live together and work together and open up space. I was one of the folks who opened up bullet space. Um, it was abandoned. Tanesh, a woman who lived in the community, kept bugging us. She's the one. There's a lot of the women who were really pushing to open up these buildings um, in, the, in that period. And finally, we, you know, we, we went, we opened up Bullet, and I remember the first day being in there. And it's just like, like Amy was saying. I mean, you go, you know, we could put a community space here. No, 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 it should be up here. No, it should be, no, I want and move to pick in a place to live. You know, you walk through these abandoned buildings and you find newspapers from 15, 20, 20 years ago and sitting on the kitchen table, you know, maybe it was, there was a fire and everybody left in a hurry. You know, you get a sense of that. Exploring buildings along the Grand Concourse in the Bronx was just like, you know, kind of an archaeologist dream, really. I mean, it's just, anyway, I could tell a lot of stories about those kinds of things, but um, we were able to withstand um, three mayors and, and the, uh, you know, ill-advised, uh, you know, guys who, from the NYPD who would follow orders, although a lot of them would say to us, you know, privately, you know, my cousin needs a place. Are there any spots in your building? You know, like that, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just following orders, you know. But eventually we weathered it. Um, Giuliani and his uh, beneficence uh, transferred title to, let, you know, we didn't have any control over it. They were city-owned, quote-unquote, although we always felt that was illegitimate because, um, again, going back to the whole politics of, of how neighborhoods became abandoned and vacant and so on. And then HPD, the city, came in and took off all of those properties and then w kind of warehoused them and then brokered them 20 years later, you know, moved that, whole, that whole process. So we never felt, and the way the buildings were taken, they, they set up a court process called in rem where they brought small owners in and, and you know, taxed them to, for taxes they never thought they were had and so on and so forth. There's a whole politics the way these, these neighborhoods went down. Um, 
you know, I refer to it as a, as a counterinsurgency effort, and I'll say a little bit about that um, um, now. Anyway, um, so if you have any more particular questions in terms of the day-to-day -day life of what it was like uh, in, in those conditions and how we managed and, um, you know, the, the group therapy that went on in these meetings, you know, there's just so many points of entry into looking at this stuff. Runaways, suicide, young folk, uh, uh, girl, you know, and then some people stepping up in the meeting saying, well, we're going to put a lot, you know, be with her and how are we going to take care of her and all of this. I mean, we, we had it all. Um, we had it all. In the Bronx, we couldn't meet. I mean, in, in, uh, when we were squatting in the Bronx, we couldn't meet um, after like three or four in the afternoon because everybody was too lit. You know, everybody was, was too <laughs> wasted. And, you know, and people got pissed off. Oh, yeah, and the blades would be coming out. It was like, you know, so we'd meet like Saturday at noon, you know, <laughs> you know, in order to get something. Not everybody, but there's a lot of anger that was moved into this more constructive vein, you know, so it's, it, it, it's different. There, the, uh, the South Bronx was homogeneous. Uh, as I said, Latino population, uh, Lower East Side very diverse, and in some ways more difficult to come to consensus because you had all these differing opinions and different light, uh, different experiences and so on and so forth. Anyway, okay, I'm going to read this, uh, this two pages here and then open it up, okay? All right, this was the, this was the prompt. This is one of the prompts that I got from uh, uh, Becky. Let me see. It seems obvious that a revival in interest around squatting and occupation has to do with the growing precarity of access to affordable and livable housing uh, in cities worldwide. What are other reasons? Well, first and foremost, as they say, nature abhors a vacuum, and the millions of vacant properties worldwide beckon the landless and the indigent, the creative and the fun-loving, to fill that vacuum, to occupy the dead space of commodity culture and bring life and light to the dark recesses of capitalist accumulation. In addition, when we speak of a revival of interest, because that phrase kind of caught me, we might also ask whose interest are we speaking about? It's like the Black Lives Matter movement. The state, as agent of counterinsurgency, is quite interested in black lives, i.e. in controlling them. <coughs> Similarly, the property-loving capitalist elite interested in squatters as criminals and dangerous property outlaws who expose the weakness of their imposed order while at the same time building the base and the revolutionary consciousness self-evidently embedded within squatting, both as a concrete practice and a subversive theory. So of course they are interested. Witness the current upsurge in the criminalization of squatters and squatting in England and other places. There's very much interest exhibited there. As to the matter of precarity of housing, I believe that it is in this precarity itself, again, the consequence of the needs and requirements of capitalists and their elite managers, this precarity and insecurity of tenure, which has become generalized even to the extent of precarity of life on the planet, that has fostered the conditions for a scenario, a personal dream, wherein the masses of truly indigent folks and those who fear becoming such unite together and seize and defend the readily available vacant housing as a means of survival, the most basic of human rights, as a means of self-defense, and truly as a means of building loving and powerful communities of resistance. So, in answer to your question, I would say this, that the current interest in squatting is first and foremost due to the fact that billions are doing it, that three quarters of the world's poor are living in houses that they built themselves, on occupied land, and finally, that the appropriation of land the appropriation of land, the most fundamental aspect of primeval human activity, giving birth to laws and lands, colonies and countries, treaties and constitutions, enclosures and private property, is, I believe, reconfiguring itself into one that replaces the present ruthless, the worldwide movement aiming to create and embody a whole new world order one that replaces the present ruthless and fraudulent system for housing for profit with one derived initially and forcefully through housing for use and later into a society of guaranteed housing for all with the universal right to housing and the moral demand implicit in caring for one another, our neighbors, actualized by the way of squatting. Here in America, squatting is resistance, this is my personal 
slant on this. Squatting is resistance to the state repression referred to as homelessness, a slow motion genocide like poverty. And that is most assuredly an interesting subject worth reviving. Why? Well, for the obvious ethical demands that ensue from a recognition of the suffering of the poor, the children and men who languish in the streets and so-called shelters, victims of a decades-old calculated counterinsurgency against the poor, a racist state repression designed to preempt the revolutionary insurrectionary aspirations and capabilities of the poor, particularly poor people of color. Further, it is my belief that this war against the poor is precisely that a war that begs the question as to the viability and appropriate casting of the struggle of squatters as a human rights struggle, subject to the norms of international human rights law and even just war theory. Finally, it is my belief that squatting is the antidote to Trumpism and the irrational fascism currently being promoted by the ruling class. Why? because it allows for a concrete and organizable way to foster revolutionary consciousness while caring for our neighbors, striking directly at the ideological heart of the landlord in chief and all that he represents. Okay, what's next for, for occupations and squats? That was the next prompt, just a little more here. Well, here in America and particularly in New York City, it's really a matter as to when and at what point the pacified and bought off housing and homeless advocacy movement and organizations decide to engage in direct action with and in solidarity with the oppressed. Thousands of homeless people in New York City against the background of mass structural vacancies. Here in New York City, there are some 63,000 homeless people daily suffering the indignity, violence, and shortened lifespan associated with homelessness, mostly black people. They are, I believe, the victims of a calculated forced dispersal from the urban centers. Meanwhile, some 225,000 apartments in varying degrees of disrepair currently sit vacant in New York City. In the US, there exists some 18,600,000 vacant homes and 3.5 million homeless people. In New York City, a municipal sanctioned urban homesteading program, this is what Amy was referring to before, this is permitted sweat equity programs. In New York City, a municipal sanctioned permitted er, lawful urban homesteading program with funds drawn from the nearly $1 billion shelter industry, which harnesses the sweat equity of willing participants could, if the political will was present, drastically reduce these numbers of homeless people in New York City. But it's not happening. Why? Because the precarity and the generalized insecurity of tenure is a political requirement of the current system, which sees full housing as a threat to the stability of the current arrangement. In other words, there is not the intent to provide or to facilitate housing for all, as this would create the conditions for greater insurgency on the part of the masses now stabilized in the base of their resistance, namely their homes. So, squat we must, both as a means of meeting the needs of the poor and us all who need a home, an affordable home, and because squatting offers the ideological door, I believe, through which the unmasking and undoing of the entire system of privatization of land and life, the basis of capitalist order, becomes visible and possible, vulnerable and ripe for overcoming and overthrowing. That's it. Okay, I think you had uh, some of the most incredible stories about squatting, and I'm um, and I'm here not by chance. Um, I've been working for 15 years documenting the squatting movement in Italy, and uh, I think what's happening now, what we are describing, what we are discussing, is not something that is just related to a minority. It is something that is related to a big. I would say, process that is involving our cities. And what's happening to maybe some of you consider a minority is something that is going to be extended to a lot of other people. 
I'm saying this because I want to introduce one of the first questions that I have to, to the panelists and to the audience. Um, one of the things that has happened, and it was mentioned by all the panelists, is the fact that there's a production of a vacant building. So in order to squat, you need to have abandoned spaces. I mean, if there are no abandoned spaces, there's no squatting. In the last 30 years, in the last 40 years, I mean, I think neoliberalism has, is producing now a new set of uh, abandoned spaces. And this is one question that I want to have um, with you. Um, this is quite, a, um, in the European cities, um, the fact that you have a huge set of buildings that are available is something that has been increasing during the years. Um, just in Italy, to give you an example, 31 million uh, buildings, 24 uh, million are inhabited, 7 million are just vacant. Just an example, 7 million, you were quoting 18 million, let's have some figures. And uh, what we are talking about, was mentioned before, is also homelessness. And so we have a lot of different directions that we can have our discussion. Homelessness is something that is very important, not only in the US, but also in, in Europe. Sophie is not here, but she is uh, working on uh, homelessness in, in Madrid, where there was an encampment of 40,000 people in the suburban area of Madrid. But this is happening in other uh, European cities. So migrants now are on the forefront for squatting in Europe. And uh, there's a huge interest in what's happening because migrations are on top of the political agenda. And so my first question is on uh, how you see the change of the welfare state. I mean, I know in the US there's very <laughs> few uh, processes that you can define as welfare, but uh, how do you see the dismantling of the welfare state colleague related to this uh, increasing uh, um, squatting activity? I think it's a trivial question, but I want to go a little bit further, and if you see the possibility to build some different welfare state in the future that is not for marginal people. At the moment, home problems are for 80%, 70%, 60% of the population. So it's not a classic uh, 19th century welfare for marginal people. Now we have to think something different. So a word that didn't come from your discussions was, is about commoning. So the idea that you're building something neither public or private, but you're taking care, taking responsibility of what you're doing. And I think through squatting, you have a few examples. So my first question is on, on, on this, for, for Alex, uh, Frank, and, and me, and also the people here. Amy. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come. I'll <laughs> see what, what Alex wants to say. And Alex, if you want to talk, I guess wave your hand or something. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, if someone wants to go first, I'll, I can jump in. Okay. Come on. I can say a few words. Um, I, you know, I think one of the challenges for mounting a large-scale squatting movement in the U.S. is that we don't have models that are accessible to most people of thinking about how to decommodify housing. Um, you know, we still think of individual private home ownership as sort of the, the basic or the obvious way to provide housing for people. And as you said, we think of any kind of collectively owned or partially or fully decommodified housing as something that is either um, sort of socially marginal or only for marginalized people. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, it makes it hard to imagine a way of really scaling up squatting to meet the kinds of housing needs that you're talking about. Because I think if we, um, you know, create a homesteading program that then people just have straight home ownership of the apartments that they're living in, um, the problem in the end won't be solved, right? Because we'll still have the commodification of housing. Um, and so I don't think we have a model for thinking about decommodifying or thinking of housing as a common good or as a common right. Um, and that's something that I think we can really learn from um, European squatters in, in having these back and forth conversations. Can I jump in on that? Sure. Yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that in, in terms of sort of the scaling back of the welfare state, maybe I'll take a broad sort of European optic or lens on this, is that it certainly has 
impacted on the room for maneuver for alternative housing practices across Europe more generally as well, whether it's Germany, whether it's the Netherlands, Denmark, or where I live now, the United Kingdom, where they recently criminalized squatting in residential property. And all of that is of a piece with the sort of the move to commodify and financialize housing in a whole series of new ways as well, some of which we saw in the context of the subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S., but there were various versions of that in Europe as well. But at the same time, that crisis also, I think, did stimulate alternatives. So you think, for example, of the PAH movement, which has emerged in Spain, which has been able to scale up people's actions in terms of tens of thousands of activists, often embedded in local neighborhoods, sometimes adopting squatting, but other tactics as well in generating not only neighborhood action, but sort of, you know, a wide repertoire of debate around these kinds of issues. And, you know, we now have a mayor in Barcelona who emerged out of the squatting movement to some extent, though other housing, radical housing practices as well. And broadly speaking, a mayor in Madrid who is relatively sympathetic to these practices for all those reasons. So there are ecologies of practice that are emerging, especially in Southern Europe, that do suggest that scaling up is a possibility precisely in a space where there is a very large vacuum in terms of the welfare state. So there are some interesting initiatives emerging. I think in the UK it's much more difficult. And, and again, that question of what commoning or decommodifying housing would look like is one that isn't necessarily uh, a question that many people are asking right now. And I think a lot of the demands politically are more in terms of labor, so the conversations around universal basic income but I think Frank's phrase about full housing suggests a rather different politics, which would be equally interesting to explore. Right. Right. Well, um, first, regarding the, the welfare, uh, dismantling of, of welfare, or as, you know, throwing money at the, pro at the poor, at the problem, you know, in order to keep the lid on things. I mean, I think it was uh, Francis Fox Pippen wrote a book years ago, Regulating the Poor which he talks about the, uh, in part, um, you know, the growth of, of welfare at that time, um, linking it to the, the, the upsurge of uh, protest and, uh, and even violence that, uh, you know, kind of got the goods that resulted in, in uh, this, this increased um, the war on poverty, those you remember the, those days and all of that. Um, it seems to me that we've moved into a much uh, darker period, um, really from the mid-70s. Um, you cite, for instance, the Trilateral uh, Commission report on, um, uh, you know, what was it, Crisis and Democracy. I don't know if you've seen it. It was actually NYU Press in 1975, which talks about the, uh, you know, the, the, the excess of democracy. Um, the chapter on U.S. Um, um, strategies for how to deal with the distemper of the 60s and what, what had been experienced. And the, one of the conclusions that they came to was that this excess of democracy, you know, Frederick Douglass pointed out many, many years ago, you teach a slave to read and then you have to watch out. You see, because um, if, you, if, you, if you provide full housing, if you provide educational opportunity, if you, if you move towards that, then what the trilateralists were arguing, it's actually Samuel Huntington who brought us the uh, war against Islam, uh, Islamophobia and so on. And so he's still around. I think he's still at Harvard. Um, you create uh, um, a desire, you know, gr greater demands on the system so that the, s the police solution to poverty has become, and the prison solution to poverty uh, has now, t you know, a whole sway. So it's, it's a much different situation now, um, at least in the U.S. So my, my sense is that the, uh, the, the squatting movement, per se, the, a movement that, that, uh, that attacks the, the root of this, the, the system of speculation on land, which, as I suggested, um, the appropriation of land is, is the root of, you know, of, of, of all law, of enclosures and so forth and so on, that it may not... Um, provide us in the immediate uh, circumstances with, you know, a, a model. But it will provide a context where we begin to at least discuss those models in a way that, um, you know, uh, can create the possibilities for real revolutionary change. Let's face it, 
um, we need to create laws, getting back to the, you know, to this uh, idea of uh, um, appropriation of land and, and the primeval uh, um, origination of, of laws, we need to create laws that criminalize speculation, that criminalize what the banks are doing. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to have power. We have to have, and squatting um, and a movement at the base, at the grassroots, particularly in solidarity with very poor and those people who are suffering in genocide in these shelters and prisons, it's slavery. It's, let's face it, I mean, this is a horrible, obscene situation that is, uh, you know, just ever present. And uh, then we can begin to talk about some of these, uh, these alternative models. And I think at that point, um, I, don't, I don't hold any hope for any sort of, uh, um, you know, re-instituting uh, of any sort of welfare system, you know, approach. Maybe, but uh, I think at this point we're looking at, um, you know, some strategies on the part of the, uh, those, uh, you know, who, who seek to control things. Um, that are that move more, you know, towards an outright eugenics kind of view, where we can just eliminate certain certain vast populations. I mean, they're no longer usable. Um, you know, th this is my own feeling. I don't see any uh, any anything down the line. Now, maybe um, with enough pressure from below, because I always feel that unless we, whether it's organizing locally, stopping evictions, you know, displacement, and so forth. We have to get out in the street. We need masses in the street. We have to create some real power on the streets in terms of the acquisition of land and, and keeping folks in their homes, occupying factories and, and uh, creating social centers and so forth and so on to begin to even get in the room so that we can begin to talk about alternative models and creating new laws, maybe through you know, different kinds of approaches you know, and so forth. Put uh, some sort of action at the base of this thing so we can begin to, to articulate, get the smart people in there, we can talk about those models and, and so forth. Okay, thank you. can't even get in the door. <laughs> Any comment or question? Yeah, uh, first you and second you, okay. So I want to follow up to what Amy said uh, with respect to how believing in individual home ownership. I believe that's a huge problem in this country, right? We bought into a narrative that says you're otherwise a failure if you can't own a home. And a home is a way to wealth. Well, first, I would argue, I don't know anybody who's gotten wealthy owning a home. It may offer you some stability, but it's not gonna offer you any wealth, right? And I think that narrative is one that we have to dispel. And then I would ask, how much are we complicit in our own problems? I think about this a lot. And I'll give you an example of Detroit. Detroit is going through tough economic times, emergency manager, the story's well documented, right? Two years ago, I went out to Detroit, Michigan Welfare Rights, who I was on the phone with when I came in, so forgive me if I was doing double duty. But they, they wanted to engage in a program. They have tons of vacant homes. And they thought about 200 families and two, 250 families and 250 vacant homes. So they said, Rob, you've been involved in Take Back the Land, come out here and talk to the people. So I started a presentation. And the pushback I got from poor, people of color saying, we can't do that because that's other people's property, I threw my hands up. It is so deeply rooted, and I'm like, how do you undo that, All right? And I think the way to undo that, and it's just, I'm thinking a lot, because I just had some Brazilian comrades took them on tour of Detroit, political education. I believe it's lacking in our social movements here. We don't do enough political education to bring people to a certain point to understand the struggle that they're going through. In Brazil, they call it formal, right? Formation. We tend to say here, we got to meet people where they're at. Well, to be honest with you, they're all over the effing place, right? But in Brazil, they say we bring everybody to a certain point, and then we move together to make social change. And then finally, I'll say we don't have a clear vision as a social movement in this country. Anybody, any social justice movement you go to will give you the laundry list of what's wrong, what's broken but nobody will give you an alternative vision in how we get there. They just go, blah, blah, blah. There's a few of us, and I don't want to charge. I don't want to paint the movement with broad strokes. I learned from somebody like Frank. Frank has been a longtime mentor and a friend to me. But it, there's a small group of us that are willing to take those risks, to move, and to have those conversations. So how do we get to that place of something that's always churning through my mind? OK, just collect a second. Uh, intervention, then we react on this 
think this more time. Yeah, different questions. Sorry. Yes. I don't know if I need my question. Do any of you know the exact legal protections for squatting in New York City? I'm actually very curious that. So different countries have different rules and probably even different territories within countries, perhaps. So I know the Netherlands, for instance, does Spain, England. And if there's a building that doesn't have a demonstrable owner, no lineage of ownership for a long time, and I go in it, do I have any legal protection whatsoever? What's the process to decide what happens next with it if it's previously public property, private property? So let's start from answering this quickly, sure. and then we move to yeah. the other. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can. We can both say if very. If there's not a lot to say. <laughs> um, you know, Are there's. You can be really quick and say there's none. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's. I remember years ago William Kunstler, the, the, the <coughs> famous lawyer, and Ron Kuby, um, who since become the well-known ABC. What is he? The ABC radio guy with Curtis uh, Sleeves was, we used to call him. Um, it, it, you say, Frank, under the cis capitalist system, you, you know, there's, there's no protection. You know, it's basically, we were of the mind that we had to just defend ourselves through our eviction watch list and so forth and so on. But the thin, the 30-day the, the law uh, tactic worked for us at various key moments in the early months, you know, because. I can send you our, our ABCs of squatting zine, you know, which gets more particular as to how this is done, because it's like covert, going in and out the back way for the first two or three months, getting lots of mail, and then, you know, if it comes to where the cop is standing there, you show him the mail, and that usually it's all right. You're not a trespasser, that's all I need to know, you see. Then the owner is charged with having to deal with you. So there's the 30-day law. I've been told that the 30-day law is not, the cops are just coming and rousting people out of their house out anyway, and they're not going for it. But then again, I think if you've got an attorney and pushed it, it's like if you have a roommate and they're getting mail in your apartment and, and suddenly you, 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 the relationship sours, they don't want to leave out. Well, I've been getting mail here. You can't throw me out. You have to take me to court. That's the 30-day law, you see. So it's in effect, and but that's it. There's people romanticize the, the, this adverse possession, this idea. Of co it's a common law notion that if you're in, a, in New York, if you're in a place and notorious and whatever, you're open about it for 10 years and the, la the owner knows you're there and doesn't evict you and you're there for 10 years and you can prove through receipts and testimony and so forth, then you can, you can adversely possess, you know, there, there's that. But that's, you know, that's a high bar. Um, but yeah. the 30-day law was, uh, uh, you know, it, it did come into play in, in our case in the, in the East Village anyway. That he talked about risk-taking. Is anybody here uh, willing to risk, like, uh, is everyone here part of an institution or a corporation? Or would you risk your livelihood, like, in filling a commercial space and having your own business and running your own business to... Uh, you know, that's not part of some franchise or corporation because it's already worse than just the living situation because they're talking about like, ah, uh, now the tax, the, the property taxes are now that a lot of commercial spaces in the city are being emptied. So, and uh, the landlords are, um, sorry, like uh, they get tax incentives for keeping it empty. Mm -hmm. So. I just want to know, is, is anyone here like, taking those risks to do like, commercial activities in the city without like, an umbrella organization, like a corporate structure? Or, and so, so it, it's kind of like you're already in the same boat because it's already moved on to the commercial spaces mm -hmm. now. Yeah, no, I, I think the question is there. It's, uh, it's very important. It's about private property. And uh, before leaving the, the floor to Alex and the others, I want to say something on this. I mean, the, the construction of private property housing market has been a long process. Um, one of the paradigmatic examples is England, where at the end of the 70s, the Conservative Party started a huge campaign to dismiss the council housing. And this is very well documented. And this has meant to sell basically the whole council housing uh, in England. 
And they were sold with a very strong propaganda, with a very strong narrative about the fact that people were going to be empowered, that they were, the market was going to be efficient, okay? And that the state was not going to be indebted. These were the three, three main pillars why in England, but in other places happened exactly the same. And in Europe, you have de different levels of private ownership. And uh, paradoxically, 90% the of people are owners in the Eastern uh, former so so Soviet Union countries, while 60%, 50%, 60% are in other countries in Europe, in the European Union. But I think this is fundamental. I mean, if you want to address the private property thing, you have to start thinking about how it, that was constructed. And it was a long-term work. So if you want to go on the opposite side, you have to start a long-term work on the opposite side. I don't disagree with you. When you brought up comedy, it had me think about it. So the work we did to take back the land, we always said land was fundamental to the struggle. And as long as it's a commodity, there's going to be that imbalance. So how do you remove it from the market? And you have to deconstruct exactly, as you say. So. Yeah, I think, no, Emmy, and uh, I don't know, Alex, do you want to intervene after Emmy? Can I jump in on the, the legal aspect? Because there are a couple of, just a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, it maybe picks up on the point, I think it was Ron who was speaking uh, about uh, uh, Detroit and, and the broader context in which property and private property has become a kind of dominating totem in terms of the United States, but also here in the UK as well. And I guess the point I wanted to make is actually, I think in the German and the Dutch context in particular, there used to also be laws that, that you know, prevented or to some extent prescribed certain forms of housing speculation. And there's not a really good translation from German into English, but there's this law that used to be the practice in France, which was, you know, in different cities in, in West Germany in particular, um, which was really a law that, uh, that tackled, you know, property owners who were not respecting the use of that property, the use value of that property as home. Well. There were various, you know, legal prescriptions with that in mind, but all of that, you know, as we move into the sort of neoliberal phase of urban development, has been foreclosed, if you like. And so, in that sense, there has been a shift. The, the, the point that Pierre Paolo is making about property as a process makes a really important part of the story. And I can't stress enough also the UK context, the role that the recent criminalization of squatting and residential properties has played in terms of, you know. A pushback against the a housing movement that was beginning to emerge in the wake of the global financial crisis, in the wake of the austerity urbanisms that you see emerging in, in London and elsewhere. So I think the legal context is really important and that drive to criminalize alongside sort of curtailing more, you know, broadly speaking, progressive legal apparatus is a really important part of the story. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, uh, you know, in common law, there's the idea of um, usufruct, you know, which is, if, and even in Catholic doctrine, um, if you're hungry, uh, you have the right to take from the riches of others what, what you yourself need. I think that's the, the statement in, in the Catholic uh, catechism. Um, and usufruct, which is the common law, you know, if the fruit is rotting on the vine and, and you're hungry and, you know, you can take it to survive and so on. Common law. It would be, wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to, how, you know, how are laws made? If we could, you know, make laws that actually allow for the occupation of these uh, vacant spaces, you know, with certain criteria and all the, all the rest, and also, you know, crea creating uh, de decommodified uh, models and so forth and so on. Yeah. So it's a question of strategy and tactics around how to create law. You know, uh, ballot initiatives. You know, uh, to put it on the ballot in New York City. You know that, like that. You know, there's 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 ways. We just have to be really clear on what it is, we, how we want to, what we want to achieve, and, and and we can achieve it. But you know, make common law lawful. And I mean, you know, there's a very significant effort in New York City right now to mandate that the city count vacant buildings, um, which is you know, move towards an anti-warehousing law, which I think is not something that's outside the realm of of possibility even here. Um, you know, one of the problems we have today is that vacancy is m largely invisible. Um, you know, vacant storefronts are easier to see because they're at ground level, but 
vacant apartments are often, you know, they're warehoused or they're held by speculators or they're held as investments. It's not, you know, big buildings with the windows burned out that you can see that they're empty. Um, you know, on a sort of larger scale, I think a big part of why it's important to really think about and pay attention to squatting is that it shows us that private property is not just like a system of laws. Um, that it, it has a whole moral economy and it's a moral system. Um, and if we go back even to John Locke, you know, an early liberal theorist of private property. Um, he talks about how private property comes through people owning their own labor. And when you put your labor into something, you come to own that thing um, if you can use it. Um, and if you're taking more than you can use, you lose that moral right to that property, right? Um, so there's a deep foundation in, in the system of private property as we all practice it for a critique based on waste and uh, for a critique of speculation and a critique of warehousing. Um, and I think squatters have been most successful when they've been able to make, you know, not necessarily legal claims, but moral claims that have then led to legal rights, um, which is what we've seen here in New York City on the Lower East Side, um, that there is no laws that, that gave any of those people rights, although the adverse possession laws are, are promising and almost worked, um, but not quite, you're right. Um, and so I think that squatting helps us to see that private property um, is not seamless, that even if it's hegemonic, it's not just about rights, it's also about responsibilities, um, and there are a lot of really productive angles for critique. Yeah, and I think um, maybe later we go back to the question the gentleman raised about uh, small business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's uh, an emergent, uh, very strong issue and that makes us uh, considering how we are developing our cities and uh, who is in charge of uh, trading, selling things. And uh, the question there is very tough. I think it's very difficult to, to answer. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, really in, in some ways with the, sh the shrinking cities phenomenon, which you were referring to, you know this phrase, shrinking cities, where there's some kind of criteria where 50% of the population of the city has left in the last 10 years. You know, there's all these this criteria, um, shrinking cities. You can, the UN has its own task force uh, looking at it now and so forth. So the U.S. leads in cities who fit this category. It's not only Detroit and Flint and so on. There's cities all over. And then there's Leipzig and there's all kinds of cities throughout Europe. It's potentially a squatter's paradise. You know what I mean? It's like, what are the risks? What are the laws? Let's organize. Let's move on these, these properties. Let's create a geometry that then allows for you know, these discussions to take place. But we don't get there until we take that risk. You see, so in other words, when we were going into buildings on the Lower East Side, people would say, you know, well, what if they come and throw me out? All right, well, they throw you out. We never got a trespass ticket. Never, because, now maybe things are different now, you know, I don't know, but the reason being is that we would then go to court. They didn't want us to go to court because we would politicize the, the, the court. You know, give us a ticket, come on, let us have it. And then we'll go, uh, you know, we can politicize the, uh, the situation in the court. So we never did. So what is the, what is the risk when you, when you think about it? I, you know, I, I'm telling you, I'd say to people, you're not gonna be renditioned to Romania by going into a building it's not going to happen. They f instilled such fear in us. There are building sit houses sitting in Jamaica, Queens right now. Chase Bank or its various holding companies in Houston, Texas are holding. They're paper tigers. We can take those houses. We can create a movement. You message it the correct way. I mean, you think the banks have a lot of good PR? Forget about it. I mean, we need a movement to, to t take these kinds of risks and so forth. You know, yes. Maybe they criminalize it, like in England now. They, they, that's why they're doing it, because they're trying to preempt what the objective circumstances beg the, the <laughs> beckon us to seize these properties and defend them and, and figure out ways in which we can create alternative um, housing structures and so forth. And yeah, raise the basic kind of revolutionary radical issues of the decommodification of land and, and so forth and so on, you know. I think there are other questions. Yeah. First. One point I wanted to make is that in traveling through Europe, mostly in Germany and what was then East Germany, 
you can see a strong culture of what was called, like for England, they call them the victory gardens. And in Germany, during the World War II, when food was really scarce, everyone was um, given full reign to develop every piece of public land. Well, that was 70 years ago. Yet today, if you try to evict one of those garden family members off their property, I think you'd see World War III really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering how that affected the squatter rights for buildings in Germany. Uh, I'm very familiar with the building you are showing in Germany. I, I've stayed across the street from there many times. Um, but m in my particular case, um, I'm wondering how we can strengthen sweat equity laws. Uh, what I mean by that is that you speak about buildings in the 80s in the East Village being converted. I was one of those NYU students who went over to the East Village and took on three storefronts. And although at the time they were commercial, the landlord was in full partnership with my conversion until the building flipped six times in a year and a half. Uh, the last landlord wanting me to act as super also suggested that I would have to forcibly evict some of the tenants on uh, rent control. When I said no, I was evicted. I fought my case up to the highest court in New York State, so I was a legal tenant at that point. But there were no real uh, powers that would force the landlord into acknowledging that. So um, I was under harassment and legal fees. You know, I must have paid over twenty, thirty thousand dollars in legal fees over over the last forty years, and I'm still in court with the landlord now. But um, in a reference to Al Capone, I was able to stay there rent-free for twenty-four years because of taxes. Um, I think you might you might appreciate that. My um, I had to do all the legal work myself. There was an organization called Goals, which you haven't spoken about. Yeah. Um, which did help people, but us, 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 us in the storefronts were we had to stay under the radar. But my uh, my legal phrase that I think you'll appreciate uh, bringing it up was that since the landlord um, was duty bound to give me a lease, but would not give me a lease, they also did not correct the CFO, the certificate of, of occupancy, which states that it's now a living unit as opposed to a commercial unit. And since they didn't do that, I was not a living unit. Since I was not a living unit, they were not paying taxes on that living unit. And because they were not paying the taxes on that living unit, my quote is, I could not pay rent because I would be conspiring to defraud the city of New York from its legal taxes. <laughs> and that worked for 24 years until uh, I decided to, to go legal. And it was a, the stupidest thing I ever did because they're still her, they won't even acknowledge my address. They're they're withholding my mail, sending it to other places. It's there are no there, the only two laws are withholding money from a landlord and harassment. Those are the only two laws that seem to work. And I think that it would be really hard to find buildings now that had no uh, deed, no ownership. So. Where is the other side of that, of people who want to go in, like this gentleman speaking of, you want to go in, you want to do the sweat equity, you want to work and build something and build a community, but then what assurances do you have that once you build that and the, the real estate values go up, that building sold for $20,000 in 1980, it's now $6 million. What happens when the rents go up so high around you that, the, you know, my rent is $800, my space is worth $15,000. So obviously he wants me out. How do you protect them? How, those are the laws I think we need to strengthen. Mm -hmm. Just another. Hi, um, I had a question sort of in a, uh, the same vein. Um, I'm a student and I'm part of the Urban Democracy Lab. And I was just wondering if you could speak more about how the history of community gardens are sort of bound up in the history of squatting and how gardens can be used as a space of resistance, I guess? It's a way of um, so yeah, there's a, I think that the, you know, throughout New York City, community gardens and squats have been really closely tied together. You know, many community gardens started as, as squatting, pro, you know, not that people called them squats, um, but that people, um, you know, took that land without having legal right to it. Um, I think a big difference is, and you know, many squatters were involved with making gardens, many gardeners were allies of squatters, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, one of the big differences is that I think 
community gardens are, you know, particularly in the 1980s and 90s, were more easily commodified to produce real estate values. Squatting, you know, looked uh, messy, looked scary, looked threatening to private property, whereas community gardens are beautiful and attractive and um, increase real estate values around them, whereas squats decrease real estate values around them. Um, and so that, that's just an important contrast I would, I would lay out. You know, similarly to how the squats have been um, turned into limited equity, low income co-ops, most community gardens now either have a lease from the city, which has been a longstanding program, um, or have been put into community land trusts um, as part of a, as a, you know, the resolution to a really successful direct action campaign um, that was led in large part by squatters. So, um, the one other thing I'll say about your question is that I think that one of our one of the big areas for potential that hasn't been um, followed as much is making strong alliances with tenants. Um, that when squatting movements have scaled up, it's often been because squatters and uh, legal tenants have been supporting each other when faced with eviction or harassment um, and have seen each other as being part of the same movement rather than being you know, totally separate strategies. Um, you know, if you look at um, the history of rent strikes in New York City, for example, um, you know, when you're on rent strike, you're not that different from being a squatter depending on you know, how much you're following the laws about when you can and can't go on rent strike. Um, and so I think that those are um, areas that we need to highlight. You should also mention to her that uh, the process, if you want to know the process, because early on in our block on Levin Street, we created a community garden. Um, Green Thumb is an incredible organization. And after Green Thumb, there's Trust for Public Land. Um, but again, you're going to go through a lot of legal issues. It, it is a squad, it's a land squad. Yeah, and if, if people are interested in, in these issues, you know, I think 596 Acres is an organization that works um, very effectively to help people get access to vacant land, not so much housing um, in their communities. And Picture the Homeless is an organization that um, has been taking a lead in the vacant building count and anti-warehousing legislation. So if you want to get involved in these issues locally, those are some uh, you know groups to, to follow and get involved with. Can I, can I jump in? Is it okay if I jump in? Okay, Alex, quickly, there are another two questions coming. Okay, very quickly, it was just the point about um, <coughs> is it Germany and the relationship to history squatting, and I could just very briefly say that actually in the 60s and 70s, many of those uh, allotments on the outskirts of West Berlin were actually cleared uh, to make way for some of the large satellite estates like the Mavericks Beautiful. There was resistance, but there wasn't as much as not one might perhaps have expected. Um, and one of the ironies is that actually the Mavericks Hospital, which is this huge 40,000 people that live there, um, a state on the outskirts of West Berlin, is actually where the first squat um, was opened in 1970. Um, and included people such as Ulrika Meinhoff, who obviously later, actually only a few weeks later, um, uh, were tried to free Andreas Bader um, and became a member of the Red Army faction, uh, so to speak. So the actual history of squatting in some ways is it, it is wound into that narrative, but in a slightly different way than one perhaps expects. But I thought I'd just fill in that detail to answer the question. Okay. I'm curious how, as technology has evolved, it has affected the squatting movement, uh, particularly in regards to security cameras. Well, it, the, uh, the short answer there um, was that our eviction watch list, which as you saw there, was before we had cell phones. So we were, we were having to rely on bikes and so forth. So that definitely helps out now when, in terms of being able to mobilize folks if you can do it from behind the barricade rather than have to be out in the street. Um, yeah, I don't have much more to say about that. I mean, but maybe technology allowed um, a huge network in those people. Like in Europe, there are a couple of websites where you find in the, all the news and analysis of what is happening. Yeah, there's and that. Yeah. Net. If you go there, you see what's happening all over Europe, on, on most of your time. Not on everything. For example, squatting for us, it was still tend to be not visible. Uh, there are a lot of legal issues. But squatting for social centers and uh, for other activities, they are always there. Um, so I think in a big sense, the technology allowed something that before was quite difficult. It was international, international kind of movement. Yes. There are a lot of books and uh, collectives. Uh, Alex published a book edited by three other. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. kind of looks like a werewolf and more of a euro. Right. My therapist is saying it's you and not as evil. It's just something that our you know, technology is allowing and something that was not before possible. Mm-hmm. You can get a clear picture of what's going on from the bottom, as you say, from what yeah. the people are doing, what they are experiencing. And it's just not only from the top. From yeah, the, the, glo- the kind of, um, you know, the, the educated uh, folks who are interested in learning more about the squatting scene in throughout the world, whether it's squeak.net, uh, sqek.net, or uh, squatnet, or, and you know, yeah, so there's that. The only thing I'd say in terms of the technology on the downside is that I, I'm of the opinion that in terms of mobilizing on the street, which you probably see it, it's kind of a big value for me, is um, you know getting bodies on the street. People substitute, you know, networking and and communicating and so forth and so on for actually coming out on the street. You know, coming. You know, you know what I mean. But in terms of that, um, you know, the re- all this other stuff about um, you know being able to to become more familiar with what's happening in different parts and so forth. Yeah, clearly that's that's a value. But in terms of organizing, I think it's still f- a lot of face to face, door to door. Campaigning on the streets is really what we need to be doing. But at the same time, I think in the squads, there is one of the most uh, accurate and detailed critics, critics on uh, smart cities, on uh, how the technology is changing behavior of people. There are art labs in most of the squad centers, social centers in Europe. And the, oh, I think most of the most interesting um, debate on privacy, how it has changed how people are now exposed constantly and the visibility of people, there you can find the debate. And the only demonstration, as far as I know, about these things were organized uh, by the squad, the squad spaces. Very few demonstrations were organized by NGOs or other people about the, the level of control that is now enforced on our lives, the level of surveillance that we have, the constant monitoring of all our activities. Only the only two things I'll add quickly is that um, I think that access to mapping technologies has become so much easier, and that's a big shift. That it's easier to visualize where vacant properties are. I, you know, was talking with some geographers in Detroit that are using you know a combination of big data and mapping to chart um, speculation in the city. Um, and then you know with just data on ownership being much easier to access, you know anyone can go online and look at the whole property history of any property in New York City. Um, and that makes it much easier to find buildings um, that are in you know some kind of legal limbo or that are um, that are vulnerable to squatting. How do you? So I recently went to Albany for a lobbying day and I was really disappointed by the number of people that were there. And I was like, most, like most of the people here for lobbying day are people of color. Like, you know, there's not like a widespread interest across like, like across race and class. And like, there's not tons and tons of people mobilizing for things like universal housing and like universal health care. And I guess this is sort of like an organizing theory question. And I know that's that you're experts on squatting, but I'm wondering what your take is on how like, yes, being like, yes, being on the street is really important, but how are we going to take that to passing laws about this stuff. Here's your Rob. <laughs> so I'm gonna, being a community organizer that works all over the world, I'm gonna put in a plug again for political education. We're not at the place where we create spaces to have the conversations where we should be, right? And that's where it starts, right? And there are models out there that we can learn from that are in other countries. Pa is a great example, right? I talk about Southern Europe all the time. Ada Kalau came out of the housing movement in Spain, and she's now the mayor of Barcelona. So you have one of your own in those institutions. You know, she hasn't been able to, to shift yet because it's a coalition government, but she will get there, right? And I think we have to start thinking in those terms. How do we collectively 
We have to move in formation, right? Form is out, as the folks in Brazil say. We have to have some type of formation where we all come to a centralized place or with a vision and how we can move forward. I, while I have the mic, I'm just going to take a quick opportunity to say there's a model in Brazil because their constitution was written at a certain time that says land has to serve a social good. The MST became such a big movement because there was so much vacant land all over Brazil that wasn't building houses, no ha nobody had a house on it, no food was being grown, so they moved at night and they took over those lands. Now the MST is two million strong and the biggest social movement in the world. So there are models out there. Our social movements need to shed the exceptionalism that we do everything better, mm. right? We can learn from some of these movements around the world. I mean, if I jump in quickly, I mean, I need to point okay, about right, sure. political communication is absolutely central and incredibly um, well put. Uh, and, I, and I think it, related to that also it, it is the, the, the generating of, of connections and solidarities uh, within wider communities and so on. And I think my experience more recently with a lot of squad movements, perhaps in the UK, um, uh, is, is the inability to really scale up in those terms and an unwillingness to perhaps think of goals and, and actions that may be uncomfortable in terms of sort of the language of squatting and so on as well. Uh, a more multi-tenure approach to housing activism that brings in the private rented sector, that brings in housing precarity more generally. I think there has been a certain exceptionalism around sort of focusing on very specific squatting related goals, which is perhaps occluded the opportunity to build a bigger movement. Um, now we're sort of suffering as a result of that in some respects, and I think people are beginning to ask those kinds of questions, but a lot of that emerges imminently out of the question of political education about asking very basic questions about why are people precariously housed and how can we do things differently? And I think we're not asking those questions in the right way right now, so. Yeah. Amy, you wanna hide something? Uh, um. I mean, just just briefly, um, you know, I think people on the left and in the center in the U.S. saw in November what happens when we take our political voices for granted and don't get involved. And I'm, you know, I'm heartened by the sort of explosion in political engagement that's happened since then. Um, at the same time, I still think that, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm wavering, but I'm basically with Frank that direct action gets the goods um, and that, um, that, 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 doing something concrete to get what you want um, is likely to have a larger impact and that um, taking visionary action as opposed to see, you know, seeking incremental change or you know, fixing the symptoms of the problem um, has been, you know, just been shown to be what's successful in terms of social movement history. Um, and so I think we, we're not there right now, and I hope that those conversations are, are bubbling up, and I, I feel that they are, actually, in this moment. Uh, you know, that we've seen what a, what a moderate left can do in the U.S. It can fail, so maybe we need a different kind of left. Hey, I wondered if anyone had any criticism or praise for the, or just interest in the, the New York City Community Land Initiative, like the land trust project that's I think it's getting started in East Harlem and is also trying to do some citywide creating of a model and some legal support. Because it seems like, the, especially I think there's a lot of explicitly, like paper, uh, Picture of the Homeless, I think is one of the main, yeah. um, the main organizers. And it seems like they're really taking some, some steps with it by including a lot of vacant housing. But also, like you were saying, like, one of the easiest ways for the powers that be to defeat a movement is to tell them, oh, you want, and here's some stuff. And then kind of box, box people into what might turn out to be a long-term loss. And, you know, do our land trusts maybe more or less susceptible to that? Or is it kind of too soon to say? Yeah, my, my own feeling about some of that is, I think it's, it's not one or the other. I think we want both. I mean, and in terms of this uh, kind of adventurous characterization that I'm uh, acquired here in terms, in terms of direct action, um, no, I think we also well, need. How would I get that? I think we also need we need the the political ed we need the education. So in terms of the the, the woman who was asking about organizing, um, create forums like this here, 
you know, just do what, do what you can in terms of creating opportunities for people to come together around specific questions that, that maybe you have an interest in and others are going to have an interest in, show films. You have a, a, a university, you know, grab empty spaces, make, create, create spaces for education. That's, it's very important. Um, you know, I think that's, that's really something we need to do more and more. Um, in terms of this uh, either or, you know, well, if this, you, you press and then the city, you know how they're going to react. They're going to try to buy you off, co-opt you, et cetera, et cetera. The urban homesteading movement, which was a permitted movement that grew out of this, uh, um, you know, grew in the 70s and so forth, came out of a wildcat squatter movement. The, the dialectic between permitted and unpermitted is, is precisely that. It's not one or the other. You see, so PTH is, is talking about community land trusts and how to organize for, for around, you know, getting this, this accomplished. Now, for those who are, from, uh, you know, unfamiliar with the community land trusts, this is an alternative housing model. It decommodifies private property and so forth and so on. This allows speculation and so on. But the, because I've talked to Tom Angotti and others at PTH, and Rob knows we go way back on this community land trust. For a while, it was, seemed like everybody was talking community land trust, right? Which is good, right? But in order to have a community land, you gotta have some land. You gotta have the buildings. You know what I mean? They have to either be gifted to you or some millionaire has to come and buy you a few buildings and then you can turn them into a community land trust. So, you know, my thing was, well, let's see some buildings and then, you know, publicize in the daily news. What do you want to do with you? Well, we want to make a community land trust, you see? And then they're going to show up unless you break a lock. You see, you break the lock, you go in, then you have the community land trust people articulate this vision. See, you have to have the property in order to do that. But clearly, this is a campaign, among others, that has to happen because it educates people. What do you mean the, the speculation on land? What do you mean the commodification of land? You know, all these kind of basic questions we're just not aware. They don't teach it, you know, and we need to teach it. We need to, we need to educate people. So, you know, the young lords, you call it PE, political education. Yeah. You got to, you know, you, you got to have that happening all the time. So whatever forums and ways in which you can stimulate that through films, discussions, bring speakers in and so forth, that's a very important task at this point. Frank, I just want to add to that. When I first started working with academics like Neil Smith and David Harvey, and I started coming out and seeing things like decommodified land. I didn't even know if I knew what I was, what I was talking about. <laughs> People used to look at me with like two heads, like, what the fuck are you talking about decommodified land, right? You know, but it's, it's something that's lacking, right? How do we educate the masses on that stuff? You know, there was a time when people pushed back and you said anti capitalist, anti capitalist this, anti capitalist that, anti capitalist, anti capitalist, you're going to change the world. But, right. you know, I, I, now I understand use value and exchange value in a way that I never never did before, right? And it makes a lot of sense. So you can talk that, you can put that shit down all you want, but it makes sense. We thought we were decommodifying land when we broke the lock. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, we're in here and uh, it's ours and, uh, you know. And then actually, in terms of the squatter scene in the Lower East Side, I think it was Economic, Mag one of those magazines had an article, I think it was about 1989, right after Tompkins Square Park, uh, you know, confrontation we have with the police there and all that. Market rate, da da da, was going down in the neighborhood. So it actually, you know, the fact that we occupied these buildings had an effect on all of that. Of course, you know, in those days, the developers and it would be, speculators would be walking down the street. You could see them a mile away. They have their little chart. They're looking at addresses. They're looking at, you know, buildings and they're taking notes. And we would try to, we had campaigns of dissuasion, right? You know, just to, we don't want you here kind of campaigns. But, you know, you have, to, you have to do both. I don't, for me, it's not one or the other. I mean, if we can build a, a campaign, that's why even in terms of urban homesteading and creating a sweat equity program here in New York, if we can cr get de Blasio and company to say, all right, we're gonna eminent domain a dozen houses in Jamaica, and uh, created urban homesteading. This is a permitted way for folks to go in using sweat equity. You know, their 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 muscles to go in there, renovate the house, and then be given the house after three, four years. You know, they monitor it, you give them reports, and all that. Um, so, for me, you get you know 50, 60 people who are living in on the street. They're in there. All right. So they, you know, that's all you're going to get, and you think you're going to buy some. No, you just go from there and you go for some more. 
just keep, you got to keep on educating people along the way as to what the real goals are. You know, I don't think it's one or the other. Okay, I think we are approaching the end, and I just ask Alex that uh, if you want to add something, but just 30 seconds before we close the communication here. No, I was just, I mean, one of the things I've, I've st been struck by in my research, and it's a quote I use actually in, in the forthcoming book, is a, a slogan that squatters in Copenhagen use in, in the district of Norebro, which was a, the best air kit we could ever build was our neighbors. And I think there's a sort of sense that the, the making of radical political spaces is, is a collective process, and, and, and uh, direct action is a very important part of that process. But it is about building solidarity, about building new communities. And, and we see that in that history, whether it's in Europe or North America, or perhaps even more importantly in the global south. Uh, and so I think the conversation begins with that process of making these kinds of connections. I think it is about political education, but it is about action ultimately. So maybe I'll just leave it with that. So. Okay, thank you. Amy, do you want to add anything? No, I think it's a good place to end. Okay, well, I have to thank everybody for the attention and concentration on this talk that I think gave you some ideas of how to build a different city. A city where there's culture, in the sense of people thinking about their lives together, so not buying their thoughts, their opinions from TVs or from big corporations. I think this is something that is coming from further discussions, how we build cities where people are thinking how to develop the place where they are inhabiting. So thank you very much for inviting me and having shared this incredible uh, discussion with you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, you guys.